of our uh, Be Intentional Walk uh, series, uh, as we're, you know, we're, it's baseball time, right? This is, this is uh, playoff time, and now World Series time, go Astros. And uh, I know some of you were there, as I already said, and we're, we're not angry at you, we're just jealous. Um, but we're, this morning, you know, the, the first week we talked about uh, using this kind of baseball analogy. We talked about um, that, you know, uh, this was Jesus feeding the 5,000, and that the only people that didn't get fed that day and didn't get healed that day were the people who didn't come to the crowd. They didn't, they didn't even show up that day. And so we talked about what does it mean, uh, encouraged, uh, encouraged us and me and all of us to show up, right, to put ourselves in the crowd. See, the crowd always came to Jesus. He had his three and his 12 and his 70 and his hundreds, but then he had his thousands, right? And in that crowd, there were a ton of different kinds of people, and they were from all different kinds of places. They were there for all kinds of different reasons. Jesus never judged the crowd, but Jesus, he welcomed them, he fed them, and he healed them. So we talked about putting ourselves in the places where God can move us along our journey, along our intentional walk with Christ. And here at Parkway, we talked about those four things that we do here are gathering for worship, which you're doing right now, growing in groups, uh, what we call grow groups, um, we're talking about going in service, serving inside, serving Christ inside the church and outside the church, and also uh, glowing in retreat. So we said, put yourselves in those four places. If you want to have an intentional walk with Christ, put yourself in the places where people for centuries have put themselves in order to have an intentional, take intentional next steps. So just get in, get, get into the ballpark is what we talked about the first week. And then last week we talked about, you know, okay, now there, there comes a time when you have to Basically, uh, you have to be engaged in your own growth. Not only do you have to kind of put yourselves in those places, but you have to be even more active than that. Jesus uh, invites us to get out of the stands and get onto the field, get into the game. And, and so we talked about, you know, Jesus' invitation. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you actually have to, uh, you have to, uh, you have to take up your cross. You have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, he said. And follow me. It, it's an ongoing thing. It's an invitation to ongoing surrender that we're all invited to. And so we talked about one of our life marks that we talk about here at Parkway. Uh, one of the life marks of a disciple is, is someone who is engaged in their own growth. You're not waiting on me or the church or some program to move you forward. You are saying, you know what, I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to get out of the stands and onto the field, into the game so that I can move forward in an intentional walk with Christ. That's what we talked about last week, being engaged in our own growth. This morning, we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, and we're, uh, we're going to be uh, you know, hearing about Jesus talking about, we're talk, talking about, we're talking about hitting the cages, right? Hitting the batting cages, so to speak, and the practice that it takes for us to, uh, to be in an intentional walk with Christ. We're talking about what it means to be earnest, in our devotion, which is the second of the life marks that we talk about here at Parkway. I want to invite you to hear, these are the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6, as he talks about uh, practicing our righteousness. Listen to what he says. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your, your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. And then this should sound really familiar to you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Will you pray with me? God, we do thank you that your word still speaks. We thank you that you're still talking to us today. This is not some dead book that was written thousands of years ago, that you still have something to say. God, help us to hear it this morning. God, may your spirit be our teacher. God, may you either use me or set me aside to speak a word in spite of me. Either way, God, that's why we're here, to hear a word from you and be transformed by the encounter. And we pray these things as we pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I was watching the game last night. I've been watching as many of the games as I was able to. And it seems to me that uh, I, I, was, I was struck by, you know, the Astros when I was thinking, by the way, I'm not holding this bat to threaten you in any way, right? Like, I don't want anyone to think that, you know, you will believe this or you and I are going to have trouble, okay? We'll take it outside. So uh, this is just a prop, okay? So, but basically, uh, I was thinking about, uh, last night I was wa- as I was watching the game, you know, Astros had the number one office in, offense in baseball this year, and I thought, you know, I wonder, between them and the Yankees, let's just take the, just those two teams, I wonder how many tens of thousands of hours have been spent with those hitters in batting cages, whether that was a, you know, a pitching machine, whether it was live pitching, how many of those people and how many hours they have spent in batting cages. I guarantee you they would tell you that that's one of the most important things that they have done to hone their hitting skills. Now, of course, you have to have good hand-eye coordination, right? You have to be able to, you know, to, to see, you know, the spin on the ball to know kind of where it's going. You have to be able to anticipate that. You have to have good reflexes. I mean, you have to have some natural gifts to be a great hitter. But I guarantee you, if you were to ask Aaron Judge, I guarantee if you were to ask Jose Altuve, I guarantee if you were to ask Carlos Correa or Brian McCann or, you know, any of those guys, right, George Springer, ask any of them, they would tell you, that one of the ways you become a great hitter is you hit the cages. I, I actually think I heard on the, one of the broadcasters in the last series when we were playing the Red Sox, I, I think I heard them talking, they were talking about Carlos Correa. I was working on my sermon or something, but I overheard him saying that Carlos Correa, um, and he may not be the only one, this may be a standard practice, but it was the first time I had ever heard it, uh, was, you know, the, the home plate is 60 feet, 6 inches from the pitcher's mound. And Carlos Correa, you know, uh, what he'll do is he'll move the pitching machine to 30 feet, so move it halfway to the home plate, and he'll still have it humming 100 mile an hour fastballs across the plate. And he does that because he wa- he's working on his reflexes, right? He wants to see if he can actually, you know, get the ball, uh, get the bat where the ball is at 100 miles an hour at half the distance. I assume it's because in some really weird alternate universe, it probably makes it feel slower coming from 60 feet away rather than 30 feet away. Go figure. But that's one of the things that he does. And you've got to know that tens of thousands of hours have been put into those batting cages uh, where those guys go, and they work on everything from, you know, from their swing plane through the strike zone. They work on placement of their hands. They work, about, they, they, they work on you know, where they'll stand uh, close to the plate. They work on driving the ball the opposite way rather than pulling the ball all the time. I mean, there's all these different kinds of things that you can work on in the batting cages. And, 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 and I guarantee you they would tell you that if you want to be a great hitter, you have to put in the time in the cages. In other words, you have to practice your craft. I think it's interesting, as I, as I was reading this this week, I didn't really um, notice it till two or three days into working with this text, but I noticed that Jesus actually uses the word, practice your righteousness. And I thought that was interesting. I mean, Jesus talks about practicing our righteousness as if practicing righteousness was the same thing as practicing medicine, as if practicing righteousness was the same thing as practicing soccer or practicing uh, baseball or, uh, uh, you know, or or anything else. He talks about practicing our righteousness. And I just want to stop there for a second because I was just intrigued by by that notion. I mean, what would happen 
you know, I think so often we think that we, we're not any good at some of these Christian-y things we're supposed to be doing. We're not any good at praying out loud, so we don't pray out loud. We're not any good at praying uh, at all, so we, sometimes we don't pray at all, or we don't pray as often as we'd like, or our, our prayer life is not like we would like for it to be. We, we don't really understand the Scriptures as well as we want to, and so we kind of get frustrated and we give up. But what would happen if we thought of righteousness, right living, doing the right things? What would happen if we thought of them as practices? What would happen if, what would change about your spiritual life and my spiritual life if we quit beating ourselves up about not being perfect at it and just said, you know what, I'm here to do the things that, that, that make for practice in my spiritual life. So for instance, what if, what if, we, what if we said, hey, um, I, I'm going to see something like uh, prayer as a practice. The other night we had a trustees meeting. And, uh, and, and I'm not, I won't call any names out about who the trustees are, uh, so you won't, you know, like, you know, make fun of them or anything. But, but the truth is, uh, you know, I, I've told you before that in a meeting, I'll pray one of the two prayers. We'll usually pray before the meeting starts, and somebody usually prays uh, at the end of the meeting. And I'll pray one or the other of them, but I'll, I'll, I will almost never pray both. And so that particular night, I said, I said, all right, I, I did the opening prayer, and I said, all right, who wants to close us in prayer? And and, and I've also told you that I can wait a really long time in awkward silence. And so I just sat there and I said, and I even warned him, I said, hey, who wants to close us in prayer? And I could tell this was a bunch that might not just jump on the opportunity to pray out loud. So I said, and don't forget, I can wait a really long time. And then I just put my head down. For like two and a half minutes. And I didn't say a word. And, and, I, and I was prepared to be there all night. I mean, I, why not, right? I mean, I, where else I'd rather be, right, than, than, than be there in a meeting as a trustee. And I just was prepared to, and then people just started kind of snickering and giggling like, uh, like a junior high youth group. And so I said, I said, okay, amen. I said, I'm going to assume that you guys are praying silently to yourselves. Now, here's the deal. I know I, they're all good people. I, I know they love God and they love Jesus. They just didn't want to pray. They didn't want to pray out loud, and my guess is because they're not confident in doing it because they're afraid that they might say the wrong thing. They're afraid that they, you know, whatever they say may not be the, be, be the right thing or may not sound quite right. They're afraid of being judged because they, they, don't, they didn't pray the perfect prayer. And friends, what would, if, what would happen if we, had, if we see prayer as practice? And we started practicing our prayer, right, by doing it, right? We did it so that we could get better at it. What if we saw... Um, being involved in a grow group is practice for the spiritual life, a practice for living life in community with other people, and not just some destination. Okay, I get into a grow group, check, and I move on. No, it's practice. And we said, you know what, because I'm going to get better at living life in community. I'm going to get better at sharing my stuff with other people. I'm going to get better at caring about other people other than myself and praying for them and helping them and supporting them and all those kind of things. What if we thought of being in a grow group as a practice? What if we thought of Generosity is a practice, not a destination. I give my 10% and here it is and I'm done. What if we saw generosity as a continuing journey towards being more generous so that we don't have to beat ourselves up because we're not there yet? What if forgiveness is a practice? Something that we have to get better at over time because it's really hard for us to do. I just love the idea that Jesus says when you practice your righteousness, just by Talking about it as practice, I, I, it just made me think of, uh, of what we're talking about today, of just what if we were to commit to just practicing our righteousness? I think it would change the way that we practice our spirituality. I think it would, pr it would change the way we see those acts of righteousness that we do. I, I really believe that. And then I thought, you know, if, if we think of practicing righteousness in the way that we're talking about practicing in the batting cages, then all of a sudden Jesus in this particular scripture becomes like a hitting coach, right? Because what he sees is he sees that they're actually, they're already practicing righteousness. They're already doing some of those things, but they're doing the right things. Many of them are doing the right things for the wrong reason. So just like a hitting coach would say, you know, hey, I really want you to work on going the other way with the ball, right? Or, hey, I want you to, you know, kind of throw your, the, the barrel of your bat through the strike zone. Just like a hitting coach would do that, Jesus says, hey, let me, let me help you with your practicing of righteousness. Hey, when you practice, and then he, he gives some specific examples. He basically says, when you practice your righteousness, be careful not to do it to be seen by others. He says, don't do it in a way that you're, so that other people will see you and pat you on the back and tell you what a great religious 
you know, Christian Jesus follower you are. He says, be careful how you practice your righteousness. Just like a hitting coach, let me tell you, be careful on how you swing the bat. Let me, Jesus says, let me tell you, uh, be careful how you practice your righteousness. And then he gives some specific examples. He says, so for instance, when you give to the poor, right? He uses a specific example. When you give to the poor, he says, don't go and do it like the religious hypocrites do. Because they go out to the street corner, and they plant themselves on the street corner, and then they, um, they, they hire a brass section of trumpets to come out, and they blow. And people actually did this in Jesus' day, and they would blow the trumpets, and then they would announce that they are giving a gift to the synagogue. You know, it might be akin today of somebody saying, hey, I'm going to give you a million dollars, but I, I need my last name to be on the building or, or whatever, right? They're and I'm not saying that's everybody is that's their motive when they do that, but but these people Jesus is talking about are people who are giving for the purposes of being seen by others. And so he says, when you give to the poor, don't do it like that. Don't blow the trumpets. Don't make sure everybody knows. In fact, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Give in secret. And when you give in secret, then you'll have a reward from your heavenly Father. And then he goes on, he talks about practicing prayer. He says, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites do. They go out to the, to the street corners, and they stand on the corner, and then they pray these lofty prayers, beautiful, very loud prayers, overly loud, so loud that everybody can hear them because they want to be seen. They want people to hear the, the beautiful turn of the phrase that they made. They want people to see what a beautiful prayer they are. He says, don't do that. He says, also, when you're practicing your prayer, don't do it like the hypocrites do, like the pagans do, because the pagans, they, they'll pray these really long prayers, and he says, and they think they're going to be heard because of all of the words. He says, no, no, when you pray, go into your closet, go into your room, close the door, pray in secret, and your heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then, and then he goes on to give them a very simple template of the prayer, right, the, the Lord's Prayer that we, you heard me read earlier. He says, be careful how you pray. And then he goes on to talk about fasting. He says, when you fast, when you're practicing your righteousness and you're fasting to do that, don't do it like the hypocrites do it. See, they don't wash their hair. They don't put their makeup on. They, they go around looking all somber like they've given up something for God. They want to make sure everybody knows that they have given up something for God. He says, don't do that. He says, because if that's why you do it, people are going to know that you gave up something for God, but then you're going to get your reward that way. Instead, he says, when you fast, Hey, wash your hair, put on your makeup, look happy. Make sure that nobody else knows that you're fasting for God, that you've given up something for God. And then your Heavenly Father will reward you. He gives these specific, specific examples of what it means to, to, to practice our righteousness. And he, 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 gives, he gives tips, right? He says, this is not the way to do it, but this is the way to do it. And what Jesus is really after here is the why of why you do those things. Why are you praying? Why are you giving? Why are you serving? Why are you studying? Why are you fasting? Why are you, I mean, just he, there's a why. What's important to Jesus is the why. In other words, in the, the way, in the language that we use around here, Jesus wants us to be earnest in our devotion. We're not doing it to be seen. We're not doing it to check a box. We're not doing it to pat ourselves on the back. He wants us to be earnest in our devotion. He wants us to be doing the right things for the right reasons. I think it's an invitation to kind of get lost in our relationship with God. I think it's an invitation to let our righteousness, our practice of our righteousness, to come out of the right place, to come out of our, of our life with Christ and not for some other reason. It's an invitation to get lost in the moment. You ever gotten lost in a moment where you, you end up doing something, something, you know, Tim, you know, like that whole idea, like, you know, somebody's pushing down the, the, the kids on his soccer team and he kind of says it out loud. I bet you somebody last night woke up their small children in the eighth inning or the ninth inning when Lance McCullers struck somebody out, right? They just screamed out loud and the kids were like, Why? What is what's going on, you know? And people, you, because you're just caught up in the moment. That happened to me about a week ago when Texas was playing Oklahoma. And I went to, um, I went to a church member's house. They invited uh, our family over, and we were over there. And there were, there were kids around, and this was a church member, and, and there were some other church members who were there. And there was another family who aren't Parkway members who 
probably may never become Parkway members because I'm sitting there watching the game, right? And the Longhorns are now back in the game. They may have even been leading at that point. It was like, thir- you know, Oklahoma had the ball. It's like third and 27 or something. And they ha- you know, Oklahoma's just basically, they're just going to hand the ball off. They're not going to take any chances. They're handing the ball off. And they're assuming this guy's going to get tackled and they're going to punt the ball. Well, he, they hand it to him. And there's this huge hole, and he starts running, and there's like all this daylight. And I'm thinking, he's going to, on third and 27, he's going to get a first down on a draw play. So I jump up. He, ju- he goes through the line. I jump up, and I point at the screen, and I said, if this guy gets a first down, I'm punching somebody in the throat. <laughs> and I looked around, and everybody was holding their throats. And I thought, okay, there were kids around and people around, and yeah, that, well, that probably wasn't exactly the, the best thing to say in that moment. And, and to be clear, I, was, I meant it as a, as a joke. There, I really wasn't going to, I actually learned that from Nancy Draper, that phrase. I don't know, I use it all the time, and it usually gets me in trouble. But it was one of those moments where I just got caught up in the moment. Friends, sometimes, um, sometimes you know, getting caught up in the moment can be a bad thing. <laughs> But I think Jesus is inviting us here to get caught up in our relationship with him, that that the things that we would do would be because we're caught up in the moment, not because we're thinking about how it will look to our church members or to our friends or to our bosses, right, or whatever it is. We're not doing the right things so that other people will see them. We're doing the right things because we can't help but do otherwise when we are in relationship with Christ. I think Jesus is inviting us to get lost in, his, in our relationship with him so that we would do the things that he wants us to do for the right reasons, to be earnest in our devotion. I think he wants us, if, so for instance, if we're going to, if we're going to, if we're going to give, I think he wants us to give to the poor, uh, using his example, he wants us to give to the poor, not because, again, somebody else will see it and and wow, you know, we'll put that in the paper and make sure other people get to see how generous you are. I think he wants us to give to the poor because, because we know him well enough to know that that breaks his heart. That there are kids who go home uh, every single day who have one meal and it's a free meal that they get at school. And they go home on the weekends and they have nothing else nourishing to eat. I think we, we give to the poor when we know that there are things that break God's heart. Because we know him well enough to know that. That's why we give, not to be seen, but because we know it breaks God's heart to see some of the needs we see. And when we we pray, we don't pray so other people will see us or think that we're religious or, hey, what a beautiful prayer that was. We pray because, I want, just think about this for a second, the God of the universe, like the God of the universe, creator of all that is and ever will be, seven billion people on the planet, the God of the universe, check this out, he has asked, he has given you permission He's given me permission to talk to him and to listen to him. He has said, I will be in an intimate, personal relationship with you. You are not one in a crowd. To me, you are one. And I want to invite you into a relationship. So we, now we don't pray because we want to have the perfect product of a prayer. We pray because we can. We pray because we have this relationship with God because he's given us permission to do it. And he's given us the encouragement to to be honest in our devotion, to to really bring our real selves to him. What an incredible gift he's given us to invite us to prayer. When we get into a a grow group, we're, we're we're learning, right, how to care for other people and how to be cared for by other people. We're learning how to study scripture in community. We're learning how to do those things. When we, when we fast, we're doing that because, because when we take our focus off of all the things that the world tells us that we actually need when most of them are just wants, when we take our focus off of those things, we can focus on God. Friends, he's inviting us to, to make our acts of righteousness something that flows out of a deep relationship with him. He's inviting us to be earnest in our devotion, to step into the cages Now, here's the thing about batting cages. They're not practicing batting. is kind of like practicing righteousness. It's not something that really gets seen. 
It's not very sexy. Nobody cheers for you at batting practice. In fact, most of your batting practice is taken with maybe you and maybe a pitcher and maybe another, uh, maybe a hitting coach or somebody standing next to you. There's not anybody really there to cheer you on or to tell you how great you are. In fact, most people would never know that you would put in tens of thousands of hours of, of, of being in the cages until they see how you hit in the game, right? Until they see the fruitfulness of what you do. There's nothing beautiful or sexy about stepping in the batting cages. It's the same thing with our practice of righteousness. When you're practicing forgiveness, nobody sees that, except for maybe you and maybe the person that you're forgiving. When you're practicing generosity, nobody really sees that when you're doing it for the right reasons. When you're practicing prayer, you're going to mess up a bunch of times, but, but nobody's there to see that, which is good because they don't critique it, but then they're also not there to tell you what a great job you're doing. Practicing righteousness takes practice. Practicing righteousness takes discipline. And, and, and I will tell you, as a barefooted, gene-wearing, uh, ADHD uh, poster child, discipline is the hardest thing for me as your pastor. Like, consistently carving out a day-to-day -day moment to study the scriptures or a day-to-day -day moment to, to be in prayer is the hardest thing for me. I go from one thing to another to another. Sometimes it's a devotion book. Sometimes it's a journaling thing. Sometimes it's something else. And sometimes it's nothing. Friends, I'm just telling you, it's, it takes discipline and it takes practice to be earnest in our devotion, to get into the cages. And yet, that's what Jesus invites us to. As, just like a hitting instructor, he says to us, hey, I see you practicing your righteousness. You're doing some of the really right things, but you're doing some of them for the wrong reasons. Let me show you how to do the right things for the right reasons. Let me show you how to, to make your swing more effective. Let me show you how uh, the, the things that you do out of the right place in your relationship with me, See how? let me show you how they're going to have bigger, better fruit because you're doing them the right way. Friends, the invitation of Jesus this morning is for us to step into the cages. We've gotten out of the crowds, maybe, and we've gotten down onto the field. But you can be a talented player and not stay in the major leagues very long. There's a long string of people who were better than the last, you know, last uh, level that they were on, but they weren't good enough to stay. And some of those folks didn't stay because they, they, wouldn't, they didn't put in the work. Friends, being a disciple of Jesus takes work. It takes practice. It is something that we do. Jesus is inviting us to step into the batting cages, to practice our righteousness, but to do it not for the wrong reasons, but to do it for the right reasons.